a lesson from the Song of Songs, the first chapter, beginning at the first verse. Let him kiss me with the kiss of his mouth, for your breasts are better than wine, the glowing ardor of the best ointments. Your name is oil poured out, therefore young maidens have loved you. Draw me, we will run after you to the odor of thy ointments. The king has brought me into his storerooms. We will exult and rejoice in you, remembering your breasts more than wine. The righteous love you. Here endeth the lesson. A lesson from the, a treatise by the Venerable Saint Bede. The synagogue describes the breasts as the glowing ardor of the best ointments. The best ointments are the gifts of the Holy Spirit with which the breasts of Christ are glowing because the holy teachers, namely the ministers of evangelical milk, excel in love of virtues through the anointing of the Spirit. <clears throat> and, sure, <clears throat> and surely the anointments, the ointments with which the prophets and priests were visibly anointed in the law were good, but the best ointments are those with which the apostles and the successors of the apostles are invisibly anointed concerning whom St. Paul says, And it is God who has anointed us, and has also sealed us and given the pledge of the Spirit in our hearts. And the Apostle St. John, And as for you, let the anointing that you received from him abide in you. And you do not need anyone to teach you, but as his anointing teaches you about all things, and so forth. Again, they are glowing with the best ointments when they pour pour forth far and wide the report of their good work or preaching, as they themselves say, again St. Paul, Now thanks be to God, who in Christ Jesus always makes us to triumph, and through us manifests every place the aroma that comes from knowing him. Now the synagogue explains why his breasts are glowing with the best ointments when she adds, Your name is oil poured out. For we should not marvel if the members of that ointment give off an odor, since he himself took his name from oil, as he was evidently called Christ, which means anointed. Doubtless with that anointing of which Peter says, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power. Surely the Holy Spirit is accustomed to be understood by the name oil, as the prophet bears witness when he says in praise of the same bridegroom, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. That's Psalm 45. Therefore his name is oil that is not just dripping, but even poured out because, as his own forerunner, St. John Baptist, says of him, God gives the Spirit without measure, for the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. And not without cause can we consider those among his elect, upon whom he has most bountifully lavished the gifts of his Spirit, to have had oil poured out upon them, just as that grace which was previously kept hidden among the Jewish people alone 
has now flooded the, whole, the ends of the whole world in broad daylight, thus fulfilling the prophecy of Joel that says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. The Apostle Peter explains this when he says, Being therefore exalted by the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this gift that you see and hear. Therefore, his name is oil poured out, because it is rightly named after what it is. That is, the one who is full of the Holy Spirit is rightly named after what he does, which is to anoint the hearts of the elect with the gift of the same Spirit. Here endeth the lesson. It's, for me anyway, rather poignant to have the icon of St. Bede, which is, um, by the way, a, it's a print of a painting by Twyla's teacher. And just to reflect, because in the icon he's, he's writing, and that at one point he wrote these words that we're hearing now and reflecting upon. These words which have such a bright spiritual interpretation of, of this difficult or at least enigmatic book of, the, of Scripture and Song of Songs. A spiritual interpretation, um, technically, in case you're curious, uh, a spiritual interpretation is called an allegorical interpretation, which is a word that basically means an elevating interpretation, elevating above the mere words on the page, what is sometimes called the literal sense, Ele not to deny the meaning of the literal sense, but to allow the literal sense by the grace of God to open up into an elevating interpretation of scripture or a scripture passage. This kind of interpretation can seem um, strange to us um, since the the Reformation era, at least in the 1500s, 1600s. Since then, um, in the West, there's been a kind of a battle in scripture uh, interpretations. And it's basically a battle between a uh, narrowly literal interpretation. What it says is what it means. That's all there is versus, no, 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 there's much more than just the literal interpretation, and um, the allegorical or, or spiritual camp uh, will win this battle, <laughs> as I've said, because the way that we, the, the allegorical or spiritual is not only the predominant uh, way of interpreting scripture um, from over the whole course of the nearly 2,000 years of the church, but we also see Jesus interpreting scripture this way, we see St. Paul interpreting scripture this way, we see St. Peter, the New Testament writers as a whole uh, interpret scripture this way. Um, what we don't have in the New Testament very much there might even be just one moment where it's not what we've read yet it'll be down the road where you can see a, a reference in the Gospels to the Song of Songs we're not, we're not there yet but, so, but because the Song of Songs is not readily incorporated or quoted or, or cited or alluded to in, in the scripture and in the New Testament and because the Song of Songs is almost nowhere 
in the lectionary cycle, where we go through the where we go through the scripture readings, either the Sunday cycle um, or the daily cycle of uh, the, the daily office matins and evensong. Um, it's not commonly interpreted, but it has been interpreted by major voices, including Saint Bede um, and many more. And um, everyone prior to, let's say, the 1500s, prior to the Reformation, interpreted Song of Songs in an allegorical or elevating way. Um, we've gotten so far through the first sentence and into the second. Uh, we're taking this very, very slowly. We're savoring this. Let him kiss me with the kiss of his mouth, for your breasts are better than wine, the glowing ardor of the best ointments. That's the first sentence. And then the part of the second, your name is oil poured out. Let him kiss me with the kiss of his mouth. According, I'm just going to review a little bit of B just to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, Who's, the, who's talking here is the church, but particularly the synagogue, the church prior to the nativity of Jesus, uh, symbolized by the bride. The bride is saying, let him, Christ, kiss me with the kiss of his mouth, meaning I want to hear his teachings directly from him, not, um, not only from the prophets and from the uh, patriarchs, but directly from him. I want to be kissed by him. The, I want to uh, be taught by him directly. And so it's a lovely, wonderful way to understand the, uh, our knowledge of the gospel is Christ kissing us. It's just so beautiful. For your breasts are better than wine. Breasts symbolize the gospel, the evangelical truth. Wine symbolizes the law um, given to Moses. The wine is good, but the, the nurturing truth from the mouth of Christ is better. And that image of, the bra, of, his, of, of his breasts, you recall, Bede, uh, shows us where even Christ refers to himself in very mater maternal ways. And um, his maternal side is a very nurturing side, like a child at the breast is nurtured. Um, and so the breasts, the gospel truth, are better than the law. And tonight we hear the glowing ardor of the best ointments. Your name is oil poured out. And so here we have um, the glowing ardor of the best ointments in 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 simple, or in simple term, refers to the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit is now active and available. Bede makes much of uh, the, uh, the Pentecost imagery of, of, the, of the Holy Spirit being poured out upon all people. Well, that comes from the prophet Joel, as, as Bede quotes from... Uh, But the pouring of the Holy Spirit itself is, a, is an image of, of oil, oil poured out. And that also reminds us of Mary Magdalene, St. Mary Magdalene, who poured out oil upon Christ, upon his head, and upon his feet, anointing him for burial. And it might be that because her act is, uh, replicates the activity of the Holy Spirit and uh, shows us again that Jesus is the anointed one. He's anointed, he's the anointed one because he is the Son of God and, and he's filled up with the Holy Spirit. Indeed, the Holy Spirit so fills him that he pours it out upon all people. Mary Magdalene's pouring of oil is, is just another example or symbol 
of Christ being, Jesus being the anointed one, being the Christ, um, anointed the Messiah with oil. And Jesus says that what she did whenever the gospel is uh, celebrated, her act will be celebrated as well. It seems to me that it's because her act replicates uh, the, the Holy Spirit, which, uh, which Jesus, in his ascension, then sends the Holy Spirit, his Holy Spirit, the Spirit that is shared between him and the Father, to, to be poured like oil over all Christians. Bede also talks about how the, 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 the apostles and the successors of the apostles proclaim the gospel, and that's because they too are anointed with oil, with the best ointments, the true ointment, which is the Holy Spirit. That the gospel writers, which are the apostles, and the successors of the apostles um, all have such grace filling them that their words are like oil poured out, that their words anoint us, anoint us with the grace of the Holy Spirit, that in reflecting upon and hearing and inwardly digesting the words of the apostles in the New Testament, as well as the successors of the apostles, the the bishops and priests of the church, that we are truly anointed by their teaching and by their preaching because the Holy Spirit is shared through them to us. And so, let him kiss me with the kiss of his mouth. Your breasts are better than wine the glowing ardor of the best ointments. Your name is oil poured out. Let let him teach me directly with the nurturing milk, with the gospel which is better than the law, because it is the Holy Spirit that he pours upon us, because he gives us his name, which is oil itself poured out. That's a wonderful and, 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 as I talked about last time, a, a beautiful way of understanding our relationship with Christ. And that is why the church has interpreted the Song of Songs, which looks like this erotic poetry, but instead becomes, through the interpretation of the church, the love story. How Christ's work is a work of love. How we are his work of love. That he loves us and he wants us to be filled by the Holy Spirit. This is out of his love. He loves us and he wants us to grow in him. Which we, he wants us to grow into the image that we, that God gave us to grow into, which is him. And so the Song of Songs then becomes the way that we can always remember that the faith is about love. Christian life is about love. Christ's love of us, first, he loves us, and his his love is like a marriage. We are the bride, and he is the bridegroom. And if we are to be married, then we should want to be kissed, we should want to be fed and nurtured, We should want to be treated with love, adorned with love, anointed with his love. That we yearn for him 
And in yearning for him, he sees us and gives himself more and more. Because through our yearning for Christ, he sees our love is for him and not something or someone else. Amen. Amen.